So Revelation, we, we kind of went through verse 7 last week. Um, uh, verse 7, I just want to touch on real quick. I'm going to pick up in verse 4. We're going to read down to uh, verse through verse 11. Uh, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit of the, on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice like a loud trumpet. And we're gonna, I'm going to uh, stop right there. Um, Oh, actually, let, let's go ahead and read 11, just so you have the context. Uh, a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So uh, there's a couple things that I want to touch on real quick today. Um, first, um, let, let, me, let, let me, I'm going to, segue here for a moment. Um, I hope that you guys are taking your faith to heart. Not just to heart, but to action. Um, I, I, I hope that when you uh, that you are setting aside time each day, some, some time to get in the Word, some time to spend in prayer, fellowshipping with your Father. Um, uh, my heart is that when, when we come together, that we would mutually encourage one another, that we would lift one another up, we would strengthen one another, that as we go out to the ministries that Christ has called us to, and, and I'll tell you what, if you are living and breathing and you are His, you have a ministry that He has called you to. Okay, and, and that's something that, that God doesn't call us and then just leave us hanging. He wants to use us. He wants us to be, be fit tools in the master's hand. And what your particular ministry is, I don't know, other than I can tell you each and every one of us is a witness. Each and every one of us is a witness. If you have a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father, if you have a relationship with with Jesus Christ, if you are indwelt and sealed by the Holy Spirit, then, then you have a purpose that God has established for you, a plan that is specific to you. And your plan may look absolutely nothing like my plan. And my plan may not look anything like another person's plan. And it, it's um, that Paul's expression of the body of Christ being the literal body is an absolutely amazing illustration because there are certain things that part of your bodies do that the other parts can't you don't believe me try going without your heart I was going to say try going without your brain but I've seen people actually live doing that some of them were my children it usually started about 12 and, and then just kind of went on through until they moved out of my house um, but, but each part is, is specific and necessary. You are necessary to the ministry that God desires to do in this world. Okay? And the fields are ripe. They are white unto harvest. One thing 
that nobody can ever take away from you. You can give up, but nobody can ever take away from you is the testimony of what God has done for you. Okay? And one of the things that the enemy will seek to do is attack that. Did God really say? Is that really what you think God is doing? He, he will attack the credibility of your faith. Okay? And so my, my heart is that each one of us, when we leave here, we are going with our, our batteries charged up, being encouraged by the fellowship of the brothers and sisters, hopefully being encouraged by the word, and, and being blessed by coming together with brothers and sisters in Christ to worship the Almighty God. Okay? And, and if you think this is the end of your faith for the week, I'm sorry, but you're mistaken. This should be the beginning of your faith for next week. Okay? And, and so my, my heart is that each one of you is, is diligently seeking what God would have for you in the place you are. Okay? If, if you are employed, that is a ministry field. Okay? And, and let me tell you that right now. Um, that should be the first place that people notice differences in us. Don't participate in the gossip. Don't participate in the foul-mouthing, the griping, the complaining. Be different. Dare to be different because you are different. We're no longer like this world. We've been taken out of the profane and we have been made holy. And so we need to let that holiness show in us. People are, I've, I've told you this before. Um, one of my roommates in college, he was a, oh gosh, he was a third generation preacher. Uh, and, and uh, you know, this was back in the days when, when VHS was just becoming a thing. And I, I know for some of you young people, you can't even understand VHS, what that old archaic technology? Man, that stuff was rad when I was in school. I mean, that, that you can have your own device and hook it up to your TV and watch whatever movie you want without commercials? Wow, and you can stop it and go get a snack and come back and not have to rush to try and get back before the commercials are over. It was amazing. But my friend, he absolutely believed that you could not go into a movie theater without getting corrupted, without being polluted. And yet, those self-same movies that he wouldn't go to a theater to see, he would bring back and watch on the VHS. And I couldn't understand that. Okay? Because, yeah, there, there are places that are dangerous, and different places are dangerous for different people. For example, I would have no problem going into a bar. Let's go. <laughs> Let's talk about your motives after. <laughs> but seriously, I would have no problem going in there because I don't like alcohol. It, it's not a temptation for me. That's not an area of weakness for me. But I know there are some that that would be a dangerous place for them. Okay? And, and really, each of us knows those dangerous places. And, and we, we need to be on our guard to stay away from those dangerous places. So my heart is, as God is calling our church, I believe that God is calling this church to big things. Bigger things than what we've been involved with before. What those things are exactly, I don't know. I have a picture of where we will potentially end up, and, and but how we get from point A to point Z uh, it's it's a, a step at a time, and taking each of those steps in faith. Um, uh, we are going to be having a, a follow-up meeting uh, uh, about Pinesdale, uh, when I, I'm actually going to be gone uh, starting Thursday. I'll be gone for about 10 days. Uh, when we get back, um, I want to have a meeting about Pinesdale. There are doors opening up. There is potential. And one of the things that I absolutely about, love about God is he doesn't speak to just one person. And he doesn't speak one thing to just one person. Remember Elijah? Oh, woe is me. I alone am left. And God was like, yes. 
7,000. Who are you talking to? I have reserved for myself 7,000. Well, one of the things that amazes me is um, already we have become aware of several churches that God has been calling to ministry in regards to Pinesdale. Found out about another one this week. And, and the idea being that, that God is, is doing something that is bigger than Glenn, that is bigger than Jesus Community Church, and, and it's something that he, he is, is putting into place. And so I, I, we're going to have a meeting, just talk about some of the doors that are opening up, some of the potential. Some of the potential doors are incredible. There is so much potential. Um, but that's just one part of what I think God wants from Jesus Community Church. My prayer, if you, if you come to Wednesday night prayer or you come to Monday or Friday morning prayer, my prayer is that God would use this little spark because we're a little church. But we got a lot more than 12 and there were only 12 that Jesus called to be apostles. It's not the size, <laughs> it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. It's, it's not the size of the person. It's the size of the God in the person. And I absolutely believe that God wants to do amazing things. So my prayer is God use us as a spark. James says, see how great a forest is set ablaze by such a tiny spark. I want to see a spiritual forest fire in the Bitter Valley. Okay. Um, Mm. Let's get into Revelation. So please, be in prayer. Be steadfast in prayer. We have the potential to do amazing and incredible things and, and to be a part of these things. So, uh, verse 7. Uh, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. We touched on this briefly last week, and, and uh, remember, amen isn't the end of a thought. It's, it's a let it be so, uh, may it be. And, and so this, this, the idea is that Jesus is coming with the clouds. I think this is a reference to uh, the, the angels that spoke to the disciples, to the apostles, when Jesus ascended into heaven, and they're standing out there on the Mount of Olives. Oh, I can't even imagine what that would be like. Can you imagine that? Somebody just, just like flying up into heaven. And the angels, what did he tell the disciples? He said, don't you know he will come in the same manner that he left? Okay. He will come with the clouds. So I, I believe this is a reference back to that idea, and, and I believe this is referencing the second coming, not the rapture, because I believe in the rapture, it will be like a thief in the night, it will be sudden, it will be fast, and we will disappear. And I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, uh, Wednesday, Thaddeus and I went to the grocery store. We usually go, after prayer meeting, we usually go to the grocery store, and we buy our, our, our stuff for the week, and we were walking, we got something, and we're, we come down the aisle, and we turn, and we're going to the register, and Thaddeus is walking like a step behind me on the left, and we do that because I don't want him impeding my vision from the donuts and the cookies and all of those things. <laughs> he knows better, okay? And so we're walking, and I'm talking, I don't even remember what I'm talking about, but I, I, I asked him a question, and he didn't answer. And I turned around, he was gone. Now, you got to understand, he was right there. I had only taken about seven or eight steps, and he was gone. And so I, I backed up, and I looked down the aisle that I had just come from, and he isn't there. So I went to the next aisle, and he wasn't there, and I honestly thought, Left behind. <laughs> I'm thinking, God, you laugh, but there was a moment of panic. And I'm, I'm, and I'm looking around, I'm starting to count the customers because I had an idea of how many were there and I'm trying to count and see how many more are gone. 
And then he come walking around the last aisle with a jug of milk. You will never know the relief. Oh, I had to buy a box of donuts just to call me. Now, you know, we, the thing is, I think we need to be living with that expectation that he's going to come at any moment. And the, the life of a Christian is, is very, uh, two objectives that are almost diametrically opposed. On the one hand, we are to live each moment as if he's coming back that moment, with that eager expectation, with that excitement that at any moment he could come. But at the same time, on the other side of that coin, we have got to live as though he's not coming for a long time, and we need to dedicate ourselves to doing the work, being busy about the master's work, so that as good stewards, we are fulfilling the roles that he has given us. So, verse 7, every eye will see him. This is why I believe it is the second coming, um, because those that have been raptured, they're going to see him from the backside, and, and those that are here on the earth are going to see him coming out of the clouds. And all the tribes of the, the earth will wail, or uh, does somebody else have a different translation, a different word there for wail? Mourn. Mourn. That's actually a little bit better word for the, for the Greek word there. It's actually a little bit, uh, carries the idea of it's not just wailing uh, because babies wail. Oh, she took she took the baby. Um, they wail, uh, but the, 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 it's not in mourning. It's, and the idea that this conveys is, is more like the wailing that people do at a funeral uh, when, when somebody is lost. And, and they will wail, they will mourn, because they will see the one whom they have pierced. Okay? And, and, you know, some people actually look at this and they say, well, obviously this couldn't be speaking of future events because the people that actually pierced him, uh, the, the actual Roman soldiers and, and even the Sanhedrin that put him on trial and Pilate that turned him over, they're all gone. So obviously those that pierced him, this must be speaking past tense. I don't think that's what this means at all. I think that is actually very poor exegesis, I think that's actually looking at something and trying to arrive at a conclusion rather than or arriving at a conclusion and applying it to a statement rather than looking at the statement and arriving at a conclusion. Okay? Because look at the context that he is speaking in. He is coming, not he has come. Okay? And so the idea behind this piercing and mourning is that is that's us. That's people. That's humanity. Because it was for our sins that he allowed himself to be crushed. Okay? So I don't think this is speaking specifically about uh, Pilate. I don't think it's speaking about Caiaphas. I think it is speaking generally about mankind. Um, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, who is to come, the Almighty. What an amazing picture of God. Uh, just a couple of things that I, I want to share with you. Deuteronomy 4.35. Um, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. You think, well, what does that have to do? Just, just give me a couple seconds because we're going to read several verses here together. Okay, So there is no other beside him. Uh, Isaiah 43.10 You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Uh, a chapter later, 44 verse 6 Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Isaiah 45, verse 5, again, a chapter over. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me, there is no God. Okay. Now, the picture that this is building for us is that um, we, we have a very difficult time understanding the infinite because everything that we experience has beginning, middle, and end. Okay? We are born, we are conceived, we are born, we live, we die. Everything that, that we experience, 
we, we see through the lens of short term. Now, short term being in light of eternity. Okay? And I think that's what Paul is saying when he says these light and momentary afflictions. You read about the things that, that Paul suffered. Man, he went through a lot. And yet he's the one saying these light and momentary afflictions. So, so the idea that, that is being conveyed here is that God existed before all things. Not he was created first, but he existed before the creation of all things. And he will exist after. He is eternal. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now, for those of you that don't know, Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. It's a, a beginning and an end. And, and then he says, uh, um, who is and who was and who is to come. This is a, a restatement just a few verses before he said the same thing. Remember, we pay attention to what Scripture says. When it repeats itself, we really got to pay attention. Okay, that's, that's the, the idea, repetition, to, to get it set in your mind, get it set in your spirit. God is, is making a critical point here that he has always existed. There was nothing before him. There will be nothing after him because he has no beginning and no end. Okay, and so he says, who is, who was, who is to come. Again, we talked about this a couple verses earlier. The Greek syntax in that is absolutely horrible because it's conveying an idea that the Greek language is really not equipped to handle. Okay, so he has always been, and then I love this statement right at the end, the almighty. What an amazing, think about this for a moment. There is nothing that has more power than our God. Amen. There is nothing that is beyond his grasp. There is nothing that is beyond his comprehension. There is nothing that can stand in opposition to him. He is the Almighty. Genesis 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. This is a title that, that God has taken upon himself so that we can understand at least one aspect of his nature. El El Shaddai. I am God, God Almighty. Okay? He has the power. We do not. This is, is restated. We talked about this last week just very briefly. Uh, Matthew 28, starting verse 18. Jesus is giving the Great Commission and he says... All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. The only person that could give him that authority is the maker of it all, God the Father. Okay? So, Almighty, the Almighty, we rest securely in the hands. Um, Paul writes that whom God has taken in his hand, none can shake loose. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so, uh, he is the Almighty. Verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So a couple things that I want to draw out here. Um, John is one of only two authors in, in all of scripture, two writers of scripture that uses this phrase, I John. He, he states his position, I am the writer of this, and then he gives his name declaring himself to be this person. Um, and, and he does this not just once, but he does it later in Revelation uh, chapter 22, uh, verse 8. He says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. Okay, so he is establishing that, that he is the one that is seeing these things. Does anybody know who the other uh, writer of, 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 of scripture is that references himself this way? I think it's amazing because uh, it's another apocalyptic writer. It's another prophetic writer. Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, Daniel chapter 7 verse 28. Uh, here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me. Again, I find it interesting 
that the two writers that identify themselves specifically in this manner, they are establishing their credentials as being, hey, I'm the one that saw these things. One of the things that we really need to get under, to understood is that, that uh, Daniel and, and, and John were not writing books. They were recording visions. That's a very different thing. Um, um, John did not sit down one day and just decide to pen a, a 22 chapter letter for the encouragement and the exhortation of the church. No, he is recording what God has shown him. And we see that in the very next, uh, in, in this very passage. Um, so your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Now there's two things that, that are being established here. First, he says your brother. <clears throat> in the New Testament church, there is no difference between the laity and the clergy. Okay, there's, there's difference in callings, but there's no difference in position. There isn't a group that is called to a certain performance of function as we had in the Old Testament where uh, the, the offspring of Aaron were called to be the priests. In the New Testament, we are all priests, each of one of us. And it's interesting, if you actually go back and read through Exodus and pay attention to when God talks about the priesthood, he actually declared that all of Israel was going to be his priests. And it was only later that he specified the house and the lineage of Aaron. And, and I think that um, in the New Testament, we see the reversal of this in that when God has called us and he has knit us together, he is, he is redoing something that he had done before and he is calling us, making us a people and, and making us his people and then making those people priests. Okay? So, I, John, uh, am the one, oh, I'm sorry, um, brother, equality among brothers. And this, if you uh, flip over to uh, the book of Mark, um, go ahead and turn there. Mark, uh, what is it? 331. 331. Is that what it says up there? I forgot that's up there. Yeah, so Mark is one of my favorite books. Um, I look at uh, the book of John as more like a, a, a romance story. Uh, it talks about a lot about the, the intimacy between Jesus and the disciples and his love for people. Mark is more the action-packed comic novel. Every, it's almost like when I, read, when I read the book of Mark, I can see these things pop up. Pow! Zing! Zap! Because he moves so fast from thing to thing to thing. Okay, so... Um, uh, verse uh, chapter 3 and starting down in verse 31 okay so Jesus is in his ministry um, and, and verse 31 it says and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside they sent to him and called him and a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you now Jesus says something really peculiar here because this is the family that he grew up with can you imagine Wow, can you imagine being um, James or Jude and being a younger brother to Jesus who never did anything wrong? Why can't you be like Jesus? Oh my gosh. Honestly, I, I can see where there might have been. I can, I can understand where, you know, they would at times even taunt Jesus. Why aren't you going up to Jerusalem? Huh? Aren't you going to take your ministry there? Yeah, I watch the Jesus show, you know. Um, but they, they've come to Jesus, and I think the reason they're coming here is because they think he's getting himself in trouble. And they want to pull him out and bring him home. Let's, let's keep him safe. You know, he's, he's doing these things. And so um, the, the, the mothers and your brothers are outside seeking you, verse 33, and he answered them, Who are my mother and who my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is, I think, a, a specific reference to uh, another thing that Jesus says, is that if you give up 
your, your, your spouse, your children, if you give up all your possessions in this life, you will receive more, uh, up to 100 times more in this life and in the life to come. And, and I see this uh, at play. I, when, when God knit the body of Christ together, he made us a family. And throughout scripture, you will see these euphemisms being used about your brothers and sisters and how you are to interact with them. This is the new family that God is knitting together. And that's not to say that you have to give up your old family. Um, I, I'm, you know, every, every Wednesday, part of the prayers that we pray are for our unsaved loved ones. And, 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 and we pray often over specific people. Uh, I think about my brother Dave and, and being the only believer in a house and, and that, that really wants nothing to do with any faith system. And yet he prays diligently for his wife, his mom, his children. Uh, the hope is that they would come and be joined to the greater family of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so when, when um, John is speaking here, he establishes, I, John, your brother. Okay? Now, he was called an apostle. He was one of the 12. He was sent out as one of the 72. He was one of the ones he was actually given uh, Mary to take care of. And, and he is the one that in his epistle, he says, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I don't think Jesus necessarily loved him more than any of the other disciples. I think John was actually being humble by not titling himself. I think John was, was, was uh, almost not demeaning himself, but, but being humble. And saying, you know, I, I, well, I'm not even going to name myself. I'm just going to say I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Because Jesus loved the disciples, right? Is there any question that Jesus loved the disciples? Right? So, and, and I know there are arguments that people make. Oh, you know, Jesus had the 12, and within the 12 he had the 3, and within the 3 he had the 1. I, I'm sorry, I just don't see the support for the 1. Okay? Um, we don't see that. As a matter of fact, we see more interactions alone with Peter and Jesus than we see with John and Jesus. And that may have been because he had, you know, James, his brother, was with him. I don't know. Um, so, brother. So he is establishing his connection to the people that are going to be reading this letter, the brothers and sisters in Christ. This is an inclusive statement, meaning that, that those that are my brothers and sisters, uh, this letter is to you, this prophecy is to you. But it's also an exclusive statement. Because it's saying that if you are not... My brother, this letter isn't for you. Okay? And so he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Wow, that's a mouthful right there. I am your, your brother and partners, which means that what do partners do? They do things together, right? Um, you know, when you have a life partner, you have a spouse, you do life together. When you have a partner uh, at, at your work, whatever the work is, and you have a partner that helps you, um, you do these things together. And, and so again, we're talking about this almost exclusive group that, that, that is those who are brothers and sisters in Christ, those whom the Spirit has borne witness, those whom believed and God has given the, the um, permission to be uh, children of God. Uh, and, and partners in the tribulation. Now, let me just specify right here. This is general. This tribulation that he's speaking about here is general. He's not speaking specifically about the tribulation, the time of tribulation that is yet coming. Okay? Remember that at this time, um, the, the church actually at the writing of this was, was under severe persecution under the leadership of Domitian, the, the emperor Domitian. Who, who was the one that was responsible for the second great persecution of the Christian church. Which is ironic because the Romans believed that the Christians were atheists. Isn't that weird? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. He says, and partner in the tribulation, and this is the testing, okay? The, the testing of, of our faith. And we all, in some measure, should have tribulation in our life. Don't go seeking it out. Okay. Because when, when we read a little bit further here, um, we understand why he was in tribulation. He wasn't just going out smacking people. Okay, He wasn't doing stupid things. He was fulfilling the role that Christ has called to him. And he says, so uh, in the tribulation, 
and the kingdom, the kingdom, remember we talked about that last week, God has made us a people, he has called us into a new kingdom, not of this earth, but of eternity, and, and so he says, uh, and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, and this is a, a thing that we don't like, um, I, I, I think this is human nature. I think this is exasperated in the West. And because of the prosperity of our nation, I think it's even worse in the United States. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait. You, you see people at a fast food restaurant that get upset because three and a half minutes is far too long for them to wait for their burger. Go home and make your own and see how long it takes. <laughs> We don't like to wait. We want instant gratification. Don't have the money to buy something? Get it on credit. That way you can have it and pay it off as you go. By the way, I don't advocate that. I don't advocate that. I, I think that is contrary to scriptural principle. I think you should be building up and then purchase when you have the money. That's my, my own personal belief, okay? Um, but we want things, and I remember Veruca Salt from... Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. You know, I want it now. You know, I think that's a lot of us. We, we all have that in us at some point, some more, some less, but we all deal with that. I want it and I want it now. Give it to me. As if God is some kind of heavenly butler or heavenly genie that we rub the right way and point, we get what we want. That's, that's not what this is. The patient endurance. We wait with patience on the things that God has said he is going to do. We wait patiently for those things to happen. You know, the virgins that were waiting for the, 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 the bridegroom to come, they waited with patience. Okay? So, patient endurance that are in Jesus. I, and then I'm just going to skip this because it's a parenthetical statement, was on the island called Patmos. Okay, and if you look, you see the little red balloon. Um, actually, at the very top of the screen on the right-hand side, that's, you can just see the little bit of the bottom. That's Ephesus. Um, so he, John, has been exiled to Patmos. And, and church history says that, um, actually, we have three or four writers that talk about John, the Apostle John. Um, they, they also call him John of Ephesus. Um, but we, church history tells us that the enemies of the gospel were trying to such, shut John up. And so they brought accusation against him for being a Christian, for being an atheist, for someone who did not follow the state religion that, that consisted of worshiping uh, the emperor as a god. And they brought him, uh, they actually brought his trial to Domitian. And, and Domitian, who at first, early in, in his, his uh, life and in, in his uh, being emperor, he actually seemed to support Christians, at least not be hostile to them. Something changed, and he became very hostile to Christians. Uh, I, honestly, I think it was just the devil. Um, but when when John came and he presented his case, uh, Domitian called for his death. And church history uh, says that John was put into a vat of, of boiling oil. And he had the audacity to not die. And he had the audacity to not even blister. And he was pulled out, and then he was given a chalice of poison to drink, and he drank it, and it didn't kill him. I, let me tell you, folks, you're not going to die until God says it's time to die. And for John, it wasn't time to die. Okay? And Domitian being frustrated that, that he couldn't kill this guy, he does the next best thing. Let's just get him out. Get him away. Let's stop his teaching. Let's put him somewhere where he has no effect. And they sent him off to the island of Patmos to work in the mines. Now, this was a death sentence because the prisoners were sent to work the mine. The mines were not safe places. They were not well cared for. They were slave labor. And because they were typically prisoners who had fallen out of favor with the emperor, they went there to die. Okay? And so... Um, um, I'm trying to see here. Uh, so he was, we believe that he was on this island for about uh, 18 months. Uh, in that 18 months, Domitian 
died and Nerva was made emperor and Nerva uh, revoked the punishment of John and he was able to go back into Asia Minor. So um, this, this all happened and depending which, which scholars you believe, between 81 and 95 AD. Uh, I think it was later toward 90, between 91 and 95, just because of the way that things were going on at that time. I think 81 puts it a little bit too early, but that's for you guys to decide. Um, so John, having suffered these things, and now he's exiled, he's on this island in Patmos, and why is he there? On account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Wow. If you got to go to jail, go for a good reason. Right? Right? I mean, you know, when, when you go to jail for doing something stupid, there's a big difference between that and being persecuted. You're not being persecuted if you did something foolish, if you did something illegal, and you go to jail. That's not persecution, that's justice. Okay? But when you have not done those things, when you have stood and you have been, as, as both Peter and, and Paul state, you have been honorable in the eyes of the government. If you have done these things and you are not a stench in their nostrils, then the power that God has, has put into place over those men will be a benefit to you. Okay. Now, just so you know, when they're talking about this, uh, Paul, we believe, was writing um, under Nero. And Peter, when he was writing, we believe it was under Domitian. So both of these men are suffering persecution under the hands of the emperors of that day, and yet they still call us to honor and, and to submit ourselves to the authority that God has established, even when you don't like them. Okay? All right. Well, we won't get into that, and people are going to say, oh, but what about this? What about that? There will, be, there will come a time when we will have to go to jail for our beliefs. I, I absolutely believe that. I don't know if it'll be in our lifetime or down the road a little bit, but I believe the persecution is going to ramp up so much against the church that uh, we will see people being jailed because they will stand on the word of God, and that will be a stench. Okay? So, so I, I think that's coming. Uh, one of the things you need to keep your eyes on, look in uh, uh, the Western world, look in uh, Norway, look in England, look in Canada, and see how the pastors are being treated. Okay. The ones that are standing on biblical principle. Okay, So he is exiled to the island of Patmos. Why? On account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He just wouldn't shut up. You just couldn't get him to stop talking. All right. And so um, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So... Um, just real quick, what I think is happening here when he says, I was in the spirit, I think he is setting up a case for what is coming next. Okay? And, and if you look in 2 Peter chapter 2, don't turn there, uh, just write it down, you can look it up, I'll read it for you. Um, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 21 uh, Peter writes, he says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, uh, I've heard people teach on this passage. Um, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and I've heard uh, of several teachings that he was in the Spirit, he was probably speaking in tongues. I don't know. He doesn't give us that information. That's speculative at best. Okay. But he was in the spirit. And I think what he is setting up for us is the understanding that what he is going to say is not by his authority. It's not by his knowledge or his understanding. It's not by any position that he held in the church. But it is by the spirit. Okay? And, and so prophecy being uttered by the spirit through the person of John. John is not writing this letter. He is recording what he is being shown and what he has heard. Okay? So, uh, so he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, there are a number of people that have very different opinions about what the Lord's Day is. Most people say, uh, seem to accept the fact that that was on Sunday uh, because that was the day that our Lord was resurrected. Um, unfortunately, we don't see anything 
anywhere else in the New Testament that would indicate this as being the Lord's Day. This was an idea that actually developed a little bit later in church history. Um, so what, was he in the spirit on the Lord's Day? Was that Sunday? Could have been. I'll give you odds, 50-50. It either was or it wasn't. Okay? So, could have been. It could have been uh, the Lord's Day as referring to a specific event in the, the Jewish calendar being the Lord's Day. Upshot of it is, um, each day is the Lord's Day. And we're supposed to live our lives as though each day were the Lord's day. Uh, Colossians, Paul writing to the church of Colossae says, you know, uh, some of you hold one day in higher honor the, uh, than others, and others uh, count each day, each day equally. Just, 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 just um, let me read this. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food or drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath in Romans. Uh, Paul also talks about to the Romans chapter 14, you know, hey, you look at this, food is being special and this is being don't touch and you look at, at this day as being great and, and these days not. And, and he said, look, don't get tripped up by those things. Our faith is not about these things. And if we really want to live our faith out, then every day should be treated like the Lord's day. Right? I mean, on which day of the week are you entitled to just kick off your shoes and ignore God? That, that kind of me time will get you in trouble. Okay? So, um, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. I don't think that Jesus was speaking through a megaphone. I don't think that, I think this is, is a parallelism. He is doing an illustration here. I don't think Jesus, when he spoke to him, his voice sounded like a trumpet. I think it was like a clarion call. I think it was something that was loud and clear. And one of the reasons that they used tr trumpets in war is because it had the ability to pierce the din, the noise, uh, the, the, the chaos of noise that was going on around. And so they would have bugle or trumpet calls so the men would know what to do, to move forward, to move back, to stand their ground, whatever. I don't think he's talking about it sounded exactly like a trumpet. I think he's saying it had the same concept. It cut through all the noise. This is something that got his attention. 